Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. My Family Recipe is a new podcast from Food 52 and Heritage Radio Network, bringing you cherished heirloom recipes and the stories behind them. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. I'm one of your hosts, Aaron Sanchez, alongside my beautiful mother, Sarela Martinez. And we are incredibly honored to uh, invite someone that uh, we love and adore. We've known for many, many years. I consider one of my other tias. I have this beautiful network of women and men that make this beautiful collage of uh, mentors and people that I admire so much in our in our industry, in our, in our field. And, of course, we're talking about Regina Schrambling. Uh, she grew up in Arizona, but has lived in New York City for many, many years. She's a food writer and the founder of a website called gastropoda.com, uh, which is amazing. She's the former deputy editor of the uh, for the New York Times Dining In and Dining Out section as well, and has, um, has also been uh, contracted for the uh, LA Times food section as well. And of course, she's the author of a beautiful uh, book, uh, which is Squash. A country uh, garden cookbook, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Sonora food, Sonoran food on both sides of the border. So we welcome everybody to Regina Shrambling, please. So I'm thrilled to have Regina here because she is the one person that would always tell me that her real feelings, uh, opinions of her, and, and and not just about me, but about everybody else. So this is going to be like a great program for me because I'm actually from Agua Prieta, Sonora. This is my native country, my native county and country, and uh, and I can't wait to talk about it. I've been doing so much research on it lately, and I have some some ama- amazing findings to tell you. But I want you to to start. To, you know what I think might be a good way to start this is for you to tell me what kind of food you used to eat when you were a child that that, that fits into the description of the subject at hand. Well, yeah, I feel like my uh, childhood was. A long time ago, and so my memories are a little foggy, but I do remember many things. My family was the only uh, gringo family in a Mexican neighborhood, and so I grew up. Uh, Lola on one side would make flour tortillas, and Lupe on the other made uh, tamales. My my mom was born in Ireland, in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. She would trade scones for food from them, and we were really poor, so we traded our government commodities for what they would make, and so. Mexican food was the best food of my childhood. Um, you know, that Irish food is not very exciting, actually. So what we got from the neighbors was really uh, pretty amazing. And so my understanding of, of Arizona Mexican is so much different from other, you know, American Mexican cuisines because it's so influenced by that part of the border. Can you remember some specific dishes? Uh, well, Every day, our neighbor Lupe would have a, like a stock pot full of flour tortillas that she would make, and we would go there after school, and she had refried beans, and we'd eat those, and we made cheese crisps, which I feel like is one of the great things of American cooking that a lot of people don't know about, just a flour tortilla with cheese baked on it and chili powder. And oh, That sounds so good. You know, talking about refried beans, one of the things that I learned that blew my mind 
was that, you know how they always say, you know, why do Mexicans refry beans? Because they never get them right the first time. But, but the thing is that I saw this, this recipe in, in Josefina Velasquez de Leon's book on Sonora and cooking. And they actually have one kilo of beans to one kilo of, of lard. And you fry the beans, you, you, you puree them, but not too, you know, not too pureed. And you fry it with them with half of the lard. Let that sit for a little while and then fry them with the other half of the, of the, of the lard. And then you put them in the oven until they form a crust. And I remember my mom doing that. I don't remember her refrying them like that because we would probably all, you know, I don't know. No, well, lard doesn't give you heart attacks, but, you know, we would have been even fatter than we were when we were growing up. But that ex- actually finally explains refritos because it was that secondary processing of the meat. And my neighbors, I think, we used all we used bacon fat, lard, not lard, but it was the same thing. Ah, they're so good. So, well, you know, there's so, so many dishes that I came up with and this and this and uh, that I want to ask you about if, if in the, later on in life, did, did, did you continue eating Sonora food or did you do any research or do you remember any other dishes like like enchiladas de chorro, for instance, you know, the stacked enchiladas instead of being rolled up? You know, we, we never had them when I was growing up. It was more like what I remember is more like I don't know anywhere else where you had an enchilada uh, a burrito enchilada style, where you would take a burrito and coat it with sauce and cheese and bake it. And what do you know, honey, about, about Arizona, Mexico? Do you remember? Yeah. You know, because one of the things that, that have been incredible about doing this research is that I have realized that my mom's food was really Sonora food. It wasn't, you know, Chihuahua food. Most of her dishes, including like pepian, for instance, was done Sonora style. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what am I fond of? I mean, I think we should... Uh, address the the hot dog in the room, which is the Sonoran hot dog. And I think it's something to kind of talk a little bit about because I think it's an interesting creation that a lot of people, it's one of the few dishes that has the moniker of Sonoran something, you know? What is it? Well, the Sonoran hot dog, mom, is, uh, is a perro caliente, like a hot dog that's wrapped in bacon that has, um, uh, you know, beans on top of it. And it's kind of this little creation with pico jalapenos. Have you heard of this 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 invention, uh, uh, Tia, Regina? Yeah. The Sonoran hot dog. It's like a thing. I've never heard about it. It should be taking off, yeah. Yeah. And how about chimichangas? Well, of course, if you went to college in Tucson, chimichangas are like, I don't know why that hasn't taken off over across America, too. It's such a great idea. Yeah. It was. I think that that somebody used to make them around the time that I came on the scene here in in New York. But there were these monsters, you know, there were these monstrosities with everything in the kitchen sink inside. They were disgusting. Kind of like Chipotle. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) No, the idea is basically a chimichanga is a fried flour burrito burrito at, at its core, right? Let's just be clear about what that is, I think. But a very thin tortilla. Yes, but still, it's fried, and you don't tend to fry flour tortillas. It just—I don't think anything good comes from that. But well, um, the, the little yeah. ones, the thin ones, yes. Well, it's up for debate, mom. But <laughs> yeah, and I think it's important to delineate and distinguish the idea of, you know, w- what are some of the uh, the contributions that the Arizona uh, region has imparted in Mexican food, and it, how does that differentiate from Tex-Mex, for instance? I think it's important to make that distinction. Well, I don't know. Regina knows, Polly. Well, you know, my I think the biggest difference to me is that flour tortillas as opposed to corn, yeah. because uh, that's all I grew up with. You know, none of my ever, I only grew up on flour tortillas. And when I left Arizona, you couldn't get flour tortillas anywhere in America. It's only, I remember going back 30 years ago, back to the Southwest, you had to buy flour tortillas and bring them back to New York. No one made them. And they're still not great in New York. But it's, I think it's the wheat versus corn thing. That's my... Um, I agree with ate, you, Regina. Yeah, when we ate, yeah. Corn, we ate corn tortillas as a child, it was at the, uh, you know, the neighbors who were not uh, at friends' houses. They would do um, tostadas on Friday night for Meatless Friday, and that was a corn tortilla because it was crisp. But otherwise, it was flour all down the line every day, every day. Yeah, well, at the, the ranch, we used to have corn tortillas for lunch and flour tortillas at night. And when we were at my grandmother's ranch, she used to have this cook that was, her name was Ramona. 
and she used to make the gigantic tortillas that were like about 14 inches wide. And she, and she would pass it from one hand to the other and, and then they would come out delicious. And one of my favorite things in the morning was to toast the tortillas on the wood, on the wood fire stove. And uh, and then put butter on it, and it would be all cr- you know all crunchy. It was oh, delicious. Oh yeah, butter and tortilla. Did you ever try to make those tortillas, Regina? You know, that's one of those things. I feel like certain things are left to the professionals, and tortillas. I, you know, I look at recipes, and it's sort of like going to India, and you look at how they make the bread, and it seems like that's doable, but it's like no, it's really impossible. <laughs> it's really impossible. Well, you know, my, everywhere my mom went, she had her little her little rolling pin, you know, which was about five inches long and about a one and a half inches thick. And I remember when we first came to cook a tavern on the green in 1981 to do that event, you know, we brought all these things like crab enchiladas and salpicón and all these things that people did not associate with Mexican food right. and they were very disappointed. So my mom brings out her little rolling pin, gets a flour and the, 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 the shortening, and she starts making the tortillas right there and putting the butter on it. The, the chefs from from uh, Europe were thrilled. I mean, you, it, to them, it was finally Mexican food. So, so that was her. That was her little trick. For real. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've dis- rediscovered is coachala and and this all sorts of pozoles that they make with wheat with wheat berries. Did you ever have any of that? No, that's really interesting. This this book of Josefina's is just amazing. But an- another one too that I have is from uh, from the Banco Rural. It's this collection of, of food from all different states, and some of the dishes there are fantastic. You know, one of the things that I discovered we were we just did a a cheese um, podcast with Carlos Yescas, and we talked a lot about cuajada and requesón, and they have this this sauce made by you know you you boil green chilies that are starting to turn red, you know, but they're still green. And you boil them or cook them somehow and make the sauce. You puree them with with garlic and, and salt and boil it. And then you get little teaspoons of requesón or cuajada and, and boil, simmer them in this in this stock. Wow. Sounds amazing. I know. Too bad you can't get it here. <laughs> of course. Maybe in 30 years. I feel like everything takes 30 years incrementally to get better as far as acquiring knowledge and ingredients. You know, I think it's interesting. You, you brought up some of the dishes up from the North. I mean, you know, there's a, the idea of doing pozoles that are different, right? In the North, uh, they make a pozole blanco, right, mom? There's, there's not a red per se or a green. Um, and I don't know if that creeps into Chihuahua or Sonora territory, but I think, uh, it's important to make some of those those sort of distinctions because I think some of the food from Sonora and Chihuahua are sort of intertwined. Um, well, that, actually, yeah, I don't know yeah. about that, honey. Well, I think there's I a lot I, of crossover. No, no, I'm sure there is. But the thing is that, for instance, and I, I think I've, my whole mind has been changed in the last two days that I've been doing all this research for the show because um, all the bozoles that I ran into were done with wheat. And some are done with wheat and beans. And how, and, did, the, and how did the wheat factor in? Well, I don't know, but they use like the wheat berries. And, uh, but it's, very, it's really very interesting because they don't use the same garnishes or anything. And, uh, you know, this, this other thing is that they, there's a lot of meat recipes. Here, a lot of stuff with carne seca. Yeah, I think that's important to talk about. Yeah, the idea of, of dry meat. You know, and how it's used up there. I think it's important. It's interesting. When I was growing up, that was not really a part of um, what I knew. And even when you're talking about pozole, it's really interesting. It's like they only, we knew hominy from a can. There really wasn't, it's it's kind of this interesting thing about um, food migration is how things shake out. And if you were going to make pozole, it was going to be with opening up a can. So uh, yeah. other, all, a lot of the stuff is, is and carne, carne seca is like, I didn't really know that at all. Meat was rare. Yeah. But we were cattle ranchers. Yeah, you were lucky. When I was growing up, I was like, ooh, not much meat at all. You know what, what some of the recipes here, and I'm sure that, that you've seen them, at, you know, we had a lot of carne seca, carne adobada. Mm-hmm. And you, when you butcher a pig, you cut very thin slices of the pork and make a thick, 
red chili paste and put it out of the line every day and bring yeah. it in at night and put it in for about three or four days until it becomes sort of aged. Mm -hmm. And it has this wonderful, this wonderful flavor. And what they say here is for you to get the, the carne seca and pound it, if it, and pound it and mix it with, with, with garlic and then, and then put it on the grill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's a wonderful technique of doing that as well. And, um, I, I think there's also, uh, sort of this tradition of being able to slaughter a pig and also canning and preserving meat sometimes in, in, in its own fat and almost confine it, you know? Oh, definitely. My, uh, yeah. My, my tío, my uncle's, uh, second wife, third wife, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> is, is from from the mountains uh, near Chihuahua and Sonora, and they would they would kill a pig, and they would actually take all the cuts and keep it in a root cellar, and uh, all the bits were put in their own fat and cone feed and, and kept throughout the winter, wow. and uh, which I find interesting. You know, I just think that idea of being able to preserve whether it's carne seca or it's it's the preservation of its own fat. Uh, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's very particular to the north part of Mexico. That's Absolutely. Yeah, it is. And actually yeah. makes you realize, too, that it was a better environment when you, everything didn't have to be re refrigerated. Yeah. You know, th there's a wonderful dish that, that that's totally yucky in, 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 in the character. Is you get the zucchini when it's really old, you know, when, you know, when it grows old and the, the slices grow thin, thick. And you, you cut them up like it seems to come up in every podcast for whatever reason. This this recipe that you 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 slice it like when you do an apple. You know how it becomes like this long kind of curly curly cue thing. Well, you dry this this uh, this thing, and they're called bachicoris. And in this this cookbook that from the Banco Rural, which is a rural bank, there are a lot of recipes for 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 using this bachi this dried zucchini, this dried squash. That I had never seen before, and it's just an amazing thing because you use it with carne seca, and, and, and she's talking uh, Carmelita, and she's talking about carne uh, asada. She said if it's very tough, you soak it in, in milk for a while. Have you heard that? That's great. Yeah, and well, let's give some context to my tia Carmela, his mom, and all of that, and what you know, so we know who she is, mom. Carmela. Mm -hmm. Well, her ranch is in Chihuahua, but, but, um, we have all our, let's see, all our family ranches were in, partly in Sonora, partly in Chihuahua. So we had one foot in one place and the, the other. Good food is worth a thousand words. This is Arthi Menon, and I'm delighted to share a new podcast with you. My Family Recipe from Food 52 and Heritage Radio Network. Adapted from Food 52's much-loved column of the same name, the My Family Recipe podcast will bring its pages to life. Each episode of My Family Recipe brings you a cherished heirloom recipe and the story behind it, from voices across the world of food. We'd open these tubs of dough and they would exhaust these incredible yeasty fumes and it just smelled like nothing else. It was so intoxicating. I'll interview writers and chefs, parents and children, about what's passed down along with the foods that we know and love. Chinese people aren't like born with a download on how to like velvet chicken. You know, like that's not something that just like comes to you. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. All right, everyone. So we're really excited. We're talking with Regina Shrambling. Um, again, uh, one of... Uh, one of my many mentors and my mom's dear friend, and I grew up with Regina, coming over to our home for many different Sunday night dinners, holidays, and, and the like. And, of course, we're talking about the beautiful subject of Sonoran cuisine, uh, both sides of the border. Um, my mom was born in Agua Prieta, um, had family ranches on both sides. So we're really touching upon that subject uh, in this podcast and in this conversation that we're having. So uh, we've touched upon some subjects like carne seca, the idea of flour tortillas, all the different influences in Sonoran and sort of the border cuisines. And we're going to continue that conversation. So we haven't talked about tamales. Oh, my God. Do you know agree, any expert? Do you know any expert on tamales? You know, the, the, our viewers, our, our listeners are asking for, 
us to have a lengthy discussion about tamales. So you write on, on well, you, well, as we both know, you start with lard. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and can you believe that lard is grown, has gotten so accepted? Remember when, when I started that, that everybody used to make fun of me because, because I was representing lard, right. promoting lard. And then I said, I don't want to be the butt of, of jokes of this. <laughs> and here we are. I know. Mm -hmm. And, and everybody's, so, and I don't think any, anybody cares anymore more if you serve lardo or things floating in lard. No, it's been a huge change. Um, huge change. Why do you think that is? Because sanity is returning to the world. <laughs> exactly. We're not so manipulated by food processing anymore. It's like we're starting, you know, everybody was telling us snack bowls were going to keep us, save us, and it made everybody fat. In the meantime, you know, we're eating shortening, and shortening was giving people heart disease, and we were ignoring lard. And lard is such an amazing ingredient. And now I think and they said artificial out. sweeteners were good for you as well, remember? Exactly. Yeah, the whole idea is, and also they started pump, pumping sugar into everything to take away the fat, and everybody got huge. Well, you know, I have this theory, let's see if you agree with me, that you get full of flavor, you get satisfied with flavor, not with the amount of food that you eat. Exactly, yeah. And people are starting to figure that out, slowly. I agree. Do you remember any, any snack foods for when you were growing up? When I was a kid, I would say that going to Lola's next door and we have, would have a cheese crisp, that was a big snack. But no, otherwise, we, you know, we weren't popcorn. We had, would have popcorn, I guess, but no. Our, the culture was like three meals a day, right? We didn't eat all day long. That's why you're eternally thin. And, and our mom used to punish us, uh, Tia Regina. She would uh, give us um, like carob cookies because she was <laughs> definitely afraid of us being uh, fat. Uh, wow. So we had like a very depressing uh, upbringing when it came to sweets, as you can imagine. Well, that was me. That's, that's a, I inherited that from my grandmother and my mother. Okay, mom. Thank you. That's great, mom. Thank that's you. a terrible Appreciate tradition it. to pass down. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mom. Yeah. And what about menudo? We haven't talked about menudo. Yeah, menudo, I think it's important. That was such a big thing when I was growing up. How do you make your menudo, honey? Well, for me... Um, I always use pork spine, espinazo. I think the pork spine makes the best broth. Uh, so I do it very traditional. I take an onion and I study it with five cloves, some bay leaf, and maybe a half, uh, a half head of whole garlic. And then just make a very flavorful pork broth. Um, and then let that gelatin sit and let everything go. And then once I skim that, uh, then I start with the base. And one can argue that a pozole and a menudo are interchangeable without the fact that one has tried and one does not. You know, if you think about the traditional recipes, right? It, yes, it's a puree of roasted onion, garlic, and guajillo chilies or light New Mexican chilies or something like that. But if you add tripe to a pozole rojo, is that not menudo? Is the question. You know what I mean? Like, what are really the differentiating points? But I think you have to start with a really beautiful, flavorful pork broth. And then from there, everything can go from there. Oh, interesting. But where would you find a pork spine today? In Queens. Chinese markets. Oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah. In Queens. A good espinazo. Or, or you can use trotters. Trotters make a fantastic broth as well. What are trotters, honey? The paws. No, uh, the feet. Oh, the yeah, paws. Use... The, pa the pig paws. Yeah, yeah the pig paws. That's right, because you know you normally count on the on the on the tribe to give you all the flavor. The mm -hmm. only tribe yeah. that I like is the 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 smooth one. I don't like the one that has the little cor corrals in it. The honeycomb. Yeah, yeah, the honeycomb. All right, and what yeah. about why are, why aren't we talking about empanadas? When I was growing up, we had pumpkin empanadas all the time. Yes, yes, and and I think that's brilliant to mention. For desserts, I mean, uh, the sweet things of, of Mexican cooking, because we were so poor that one of the things that gave us great pleasure was the one time a year you can yeah, have Yeah, a things. savory, a, a sweet uh, pumpkin empanada. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, they're wonderful. Maybe with a little bit of Mexican cinnamon, no, Regina? Yeah. A little canela? Yeah, exactly. There oh, was man. Yeah, they were, I, that, I can taste that today. Well, you know, my favorite, uh, my favorite Sonora pastry are coyotas. 
And what are they? Coyotas. Which are? They're, they they have actually yeast in them. It's like this bread that's stuffed with piloncillo. Oh. It's like two it's like two tor- flour tortillas kind of put together. Oh right right. And then there's and there's the, the inside is the piloncillo. You know what? Got I, it. I haven't thought about that in decades. Thirty years. But yeah, we th- that was actually something we ate because you know the the sandwich we took to school was peanut butter and brown sugar. Not jelly. So, mm. yes, it was tortillas stuffed with sugar. And what kind of bread? Oh, white bread, of course. But, I mean, I forgot about the tortillas with the sugar. Extraordinary. Especially when, when they're made with, 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 uh, with yeast, you know, because right. it has, it has a, that leavening has a totally different flavor. Exactly. Yeah, and a lightness to it. Yeah, I love them. Right. Anytime anybody comes from Sonora, I say, please bring me some coyotas, but only bring me two <laughs> because they're so, they're so fattening. It's like, you know, when people want to bring you chocolate, I said, that is so inconsiderate of them. Uh, you want to bring me okay, two? mom. Well, not everyone thinks like that, mom. You know, <laughs> mom I'm kidding, story, honey. <laughs> but I think we need to post a, we need to post a recipe for the Sonoran hot dog because I think it's something that's iconic, something that you get when you come out of a cantina. And you and it's dubbed the Sonoran hot dog. You've had one, right, Regina? You no, know, I never have. But I was reading your. But you've known of them, right? No, until now, I've really never thought about it. But I noticed that your grandmother, in her, I read, I reread her book today, and she talked a lot about putting wieners in everything. And it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, that actually sounds well, pretty good. The Sonoran hot dog is a thing. I'm sorry to uh, to uh, disheartening you, ladies, but it's a thing. Okay. And you find them in cantinas on the border, and it's basically something when you come out of a uh, you know a club or an antro, you'll have somebody making these little hot dogs. And what's on them again? The Sonoran hot dog. So it's a, a, a hot dog wrapped in bacon with beans and probably pickled jalapenos and some good stuff on top. What kind of beans? Probably char- you know like charro beans or pintos. Well, you know anything is good with bacon. And I could see those taking off at a at a. A, a hot dog truck. Yep. And isn't it strange that burritos have not taken off here in, in, in New York? Well, the thing to me is always amazing that we, I grew up calling them burros. They weren't burritos. They were burros. Yeah, oh, burros. Really? Exactly. Yeah, we never had burritos. I, burritos is an, an East Coast thing to me. Absolutely. They're always burros. They were burros. burros. And, the, and the big difference is that the burros on the border don't have rice, beans, no. or any of that. It's just the meat in a flour tortilla. Right. Like chili corrado or whatever it is, just wrapped in a flour tortilla. Right. Well, you're talking about flour tortillas. Always. Your mama made the best tortilla. I know she did. And then a, a, bu- a burro enchilada style was, to me, the quintessential Arizona dish. But is that like an enchilado? No, it's actually, you would go and say, I want a burro, I want a burro, a a bean burro or a meat burro, but I want it yep. enchilada style, coated in the sauce, run it under the broiler with yep. some um, cheese. Well, anything's good with cheese. Well, yeah, and under the broiler. Exactly. Have, have you by any chance gone to gone to Sobremasa? No. Oh, we have to go there. T- uh, we have to go together. Okay. You know, he, this is a chef from, from Oaxaca, and he's making uh, only native corn tortillas and corn products. He's got this amazing Oaxacan food, but the tor- the, pl- the corn tortillas are amazing. And where is he based? In in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. In he's got a little restaurant in Williamsburg, but he's built, building a huge tortilla in, and what's the other one that starts with B? Bushwick. Bushwick. Yeah, and he's a very very talented young man, very dedicated to the cause, understands the long term goal of. And it's not something that's like a novelty thing for him. Like he's really dedicated about bringing the native corn varieties and understanding their sustainability and, and all that good stuff that we need to focus on and pay attention to. So really amazing guy. He was our first guest on the podcast ages ago. And he taught us so many things. Probably the thing that was the most interesting to me, and I guess I don't mention it once, once in a while, is he mentioned about the, the corn silk. That every single strand of silk is one kernel of corn. Right. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's too bad that, I, you know, I gave so many conferences on corn. and But at that time, we didn't have the native corn, and now it's like everywhere. 
Right, and it's great that it's being preserved, though, because when you think about it, so many indigenous things are just being wiped out, and it's good that things are being preserved. And they're and they're making they're making an artisanal, a corn whiskey, uh, in the north. Uh, one of the brands is called Absalon, which is beautiful, and we had uh, Yira, our friend, who is championing uh, spirits that are uh, distilled. Uh, and derived from artisanal corn. So it's a big deal. You know, one of the interesting things about this book that I tell you about that I'm looking at is that my mom used to make pipian. You know, I'm used to the pipian from the, from the South that has a lot of different flavors. And my mom's pipian was only was roasted tomatoes, very, very nicely roasted tomatoes, charred actually, with red chili sauce, and the pumpkin seeds, and, and and she used to serve it with tongue, and she also used to serve it with green beans. And the other day I made it, and it was just like going home. It was so fantastic, and it was so plain. I mean, there was I think it had a tiny little bit of oregano, but that was the only seasoning. Did you have it with tongue or with green beans? With green beans, I I haven't mastered the tongue situation. Yeah, the tongue situation's that... difficult. <laughs> I, <laughs> It's not that challenging, ladies. It's not, you know. <laughs> I, I always treat tongue like you would treat octopus. Oh. You got to cook it, you know, for 45 minutes or whatever, an hour, and then let it sit in that same liquid for, for another 45. You know, and then you and then you peel, and then you just peel that outer skin, and it's wonderful. And then you wish you had a Sonoran so hot dog. I, I treat, you know, tongue like octopus. <laughs> Huh? You just wish you had a <laughs> Sonoran hot dog at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You guys laugh at the Sonoran hot dog. Wait till you taste it, okay? You mock. I want to see those hot dog understand. trucks on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, Regina, again, how can people engage with you? Because we love to promote our guests um, and all the things they're working on. Do you feel comfortable sharing? Your website and people oh, yeah. can engage with you. Well, my website is a little dusty these days. It's gastropoda.com, but I'm on Twitter as also gastropoda or with my real name. And I, I do I do engage on Twitter, and I especially like to argue on Twitter because I, one thing about food is you're never wrong. It's about taste. <laughs> exactly. It's really, it's about taste. You know, there's things you can be right about and things you can be wrong about. And when it comes to t- your personal taste, that's you. You're always right with your personal yeah. taste, and you can be educated about ingredients and every other thing. But you know, yeah, please, please tell my mom that, Regina. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what, what, are, what are you referring to? <laughs> mom, it's a matter of taste, mom, and you don't have to be right because it's a matter of taste. All oh, the I time. don't, I don't, I don't you have know? to be right. I'd love to be contrary. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, mom. It's all good. <laughs> yes, mom. Um, so, yes, ma'am. But so they can they can reach out to you on Twitter, right, uh, Miss Regina, and all that good stuff. Yes, and right. where are you to be found these days? Well, you can find me in New Orleans. Um, oh, right, I have you a little there simple now. restaurant called Johnny Sanchez. That's and, right. That's right. And so it, we'd love to have you down in New Orleans, and maybe I'd love come to down get back there. when it's not so hot. Um, but maybe coming like in the right after Mardi Gras is a great time to come, like the first week of March. Um, and then maybe you can go do a boucherie. A boucherie is a wonderful Louisiana tradition where you slaughter a whole pig and then you spend like two days camping and then everyone uh, is sort of tacked with one part of the pig. And there's a crackling team. There's somebody that makes sausage. There's somebody that roasts it. It's a, a lot of fun. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, Regina, thank you so much. Uh, we have, of course, the incomparable Regina Shrambling that's joined us today talking about all things Sonoran, uh, both sides of the border, connecting with my mom and her beautiful childhood. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you on another episode of Cooking in Mexico for Made I'm Aaron Sanchez, alongside my beautiful mom. Sarela Martinez. And, of course, you're listening to Heritage Radio Network, and we thank you profusely. Muchísimas gracias. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. 
Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.